party. Terry, what do you think? Do we want to? Uh, we could start. Yeah. We could start with these uh, introductions. And hi, everybody. Um, very special welcome to all. Thank you so much for joining us at Punto de Contacto, Point of Contact Gallery. We are immensely proud to present Rewriting History as our fall season exhibit. This extraordinary body of work by Haitian American artist Fabiola Jean Louis, who joins us this evening. We are super excited for all of you to meet her and our distinguished panelists. Rewriting History is a program of the 2020 Syracuse Symposium on Futures, a program of the Syracuse University Humanities Center. The Humanities Center, Syracuse Symposium, and the Point of Contact Gallery acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. My name is Tere Paniagua, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at the College of Arts and Sciences, Syracuse University. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Punto de Contacto is a contemporary art center in residence at Syracuse University since 1975. Support for this program comes from Syracuse University's College of Arts and Sciences, its Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, as well as the Coalition of Museum and Art Centers, CMAC at Syracuse, and the Headspeth Art Consulting. We could not do this without all of you. So thank you for the support, mil gracias. I know I now would like to introduce the director of Point of Contact Gallery, who has poured her heart and soul into this project for well over a year now. Sara Feliz, thank you for your amazing work. Once again, welcome everybody. We love having you with us. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted to connect with all of you this evening. For those of you that don't know me, I am Sara Feliz, director of Point of Contact Gallery. I do have a brief announcement before we get started. In light of Syracuse University going fully remote in the last 24 hours, we have been instructed, unfortunately, by university leadership to halt all appointments for rewriting history at this time. While we are saddened by this news, we want to keep our community members safe. Um, since we can no longer share this exhibition with you in person, um, I am delighted to share with you a virtual tour, which will be guided by the voices of our panelists this evening. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Fabiola Jean-Louis recounts the tranquility of death, life, and human maturation by reviving Black beauty that has been forsaken throughout Western civilization. Rewriting history is pure alchemy, true Black girl magic. It summons people to critically acknowledge the suppression and oppression of Black people while empowering individuals to see that the experiences of Black women are not linear, but unconditional. The phenomenological experiences of Black women are not intangible in this exhibition, but mere Black aunts, sisters, neighbors, and homegirls, mimicking a fusion of artistic realism and the reincarnation of the past. The fierce gaze present in Conquistador II is mesmerizing. Observing her emotionally layered appearance presents a spectrum of scorn to joy and serenity to vexation. With the emotions of Black people being weaponized in fear in this anti-Black society, this creative complexity seen in Conquistador II could also have a contentious perception. Stroking the heart of visual realism, this piece and exhibition 
makes parallels to the various emotions Jews as an excuse for murdering Black people in the United States. Conquistador II provokes the memory of racial injustice in the past and reveals this continuous cycle in the present. In the hands of Fabiola Jean Louis, the mortality of paper is prosperity, a material that seems to be weightless, malleable, blank, and undervalued. Black women have always had the power to make something out of nothing while continually having opportunities and resources removed by the fragility of Western systems. Paper was, and continues to be, used to write amendments and laws against Black people. But for Fabiola Jean-Louis, she reclaims the same material and brings beauty and color within her mastery of photography and papermaking. Rewriting history isn't just a work of art. It reminds me that Black power and magnificence portrayed in each sculpture and photograph isn't just for display, but also lives within me. They say we enjoy them. A solitary light-skinned Black woman standing, looking out past the view, a pampered dog at her feet, while behind her, in a lush green landscape, a scene of rape is perpetrated out in the open. A mansion moves as a backdrop partially hidden by trees, as a menacing red moon hangs in the sky. The figure's calm, almost dreamy demeanor sharply contrasts with the violent activity behind her. Her gown is beautiful, regal and golden, and her expression can be read as knowing with a hint of sadness for what is the truth. The victim in the background scene is the darkest figure of all, perhaps suggesting that the central light-skinned figure is a product of rape. The work reminds us that exploitation is hidden in plain sight. I am several decades older than John Lee, and I too remember being in the Metropolitan Museum of Art on school trips and being amazed by the same kind of paintings. However, I didn't notice that no one looked like me. I did not connect the exploitation of my own family with the eager white faces which come down at me from those ornate frames. Yet the fact that I am a descendant of slaves was no secret to me, even at a very young age. My own experience with this body of work is that it can change how viewers think of European origins. And I myself question just how Eurocentric are these ornate gowns. Although Black women are eluded from most 15th to 19th century classical art through whitewashing, we know that Africans and Europeans interacted with each other. And these cross-cultural experiences have implications of influence in many areas, including fashion. Furthermore, jean louis body of work lends another consideration that exchanges with other worlds of color impacted European standards of beauty. We cannot dislodge European aesthetics from a history of exchanges with different cultures. And this ontological perspective is further demonstrated in jean louis use of paper as the predominant medium in her work. The use of paper adds another layer to the conversation the artist is having in this exhibition. The rewriting history's use of sculpture dresses, shoes, and corsets made of paper are displayed bodiless throughout the show. When considering that the artist is rewriting history in her art, it is the optimal material of choice. Jean-Louis' work causes me to examine the relationship between paper and the African diaspora experience. Conceptually, even paper is African in origin. Ironically, in Western society, this material has been weaponized against Black bodies through its use as currency, pseudoscientific documentation, distorted written histories, mapping, and legally binding documents drafted to sustain Black subjugation institutionally. Paper has also secured Black liberation through manumission, the amendment of racist laws, 
and the spread of the gospel of abolition and counter narratives of the black experience, to name a few. Viewers of rewriting history are left to experience the reality of injustice through beauty in ways that feel ambiguous but clear and contradictory yet compatible with the nonlinear process that comes with rewriting history. This exhibition's beauty has less to do with the novelty of Black women wearing period gowns and more so to the beauty and elegance that Black women's presence brings to them. In sum, rewriting history means that there are different pathways of considering the past, some of which open up a space for healing. Thank you, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel, Ohima Dixon. Uh, Ohima Dixon is a photographer located in the New York City area. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art Photography from Syracuse University. Her artistic work focuses on capturing moments of the Black experience and Black feminine narrative through me the mechanisms of Afrofuturist thought and the archive. We are delighted to have her insight, depth of knowledge, and artistic perspective with us this evening. Welcome, Ohima. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to be here. And so, you know, we all have stuff. I'm more than honored to include this amazing group of women, and I'm always happy when I see Black women getting together for conversation. And so, first off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tanisha M. Jackson. Dr. Tanisha M. Jackson joined the African American Studies Department in the College of Arts and Sciences as the Executive Director of the Community Folk Arts Center at, and, at, and a Professor of Practice in African American Studies in spring 2019. At Syracuse University, Jackson teaches classes in African dance. Oh, we lost her. That's okay. Tanisha, do you want to <laughs> talk a little bit about yourself while she reconnects? I can certainly okay. introduce myself. Sure. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Tanisha Jackson or Tanisha. I am the executive director of the Community Folk Arts Center here at Syracuse University and also a professor in the Department of African American Studies where I teach uh, art of the African diaspora, black film, visual culture. And so I focus, my research focus specifically is on black women um, and our representation in visual and digital spaces, as well as uh, community-based arts. And so it is a pleasure that I'm here to talk uh, about and, and to engage in dialogue with you, Fabiola and others, because it aligns with so much of my life's work, so. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, next on is Yvonne Buchanan. Um, Yvonne Buchanan is an associate professor of studio arts in the School of Art. She was born in Manhattan, New York. She holds an MFA in film and video from the Milton Avery Graduate School at Bard College and a BFA in illustration from Parsons School of Design. Buchanan uses video, animation, photography, illustration, and drawing to create micro narratives of ghostly presence of histories, individual, family, and community experiences of otherness, and the perpetual small and large trauma sustained is the focus of her recent work. Buchanan's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally at Syracuse International Film Festival, Studio Museum in Harlem, Santa Fe, Site Santa Fe, Slam Dance International Film Festival. Hammer Museum, UCLA, Society of Illustrators, Ever Everson Museum of Art, Munson Williams Proctor Museum of Art, Urban Video oh, Project. Ohima? Yes? You don't have to go through all of that. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I have listed to me. I'm sorry. But as you can tell, Dr. <laughs> Buchanan is very strong. <laughs> um, next up, we have Shanna Jellen. Um, Shanna Jellen is a doctoral gen uh, candidate at Syracuse University in counseling and counselor education and currently holds a certificate of advanced studies in women's and gender studies from SU. She is also a board certified counselor and holds a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. 
Before beginning her doctoral work, she was a child and family therapist working with clients ages four to 19 and their families. While in Syracuse, she was a graduate assistant for mentoring programs at the Office of Multicultural Affairs, facilitating mentoring programs for undergraduate students of color at SCU. Both her clinical experiences and graduate assistantship have influenced her scholarship, which includes counseling publications and presentations on feminist pedagogy and Afro-Caribbean college students' narratives. For her work, she was also awarded the National Board of Certified Counselors Minority Doctoral Fellowship in 2018. Currently, she is focused on completing a feminist phenomenological dissertation titled An Exploration of Self-Identity Experiences Within the Lives of Afro-Caribbean Women Undergraduate College Students, which explores intersectional perspectives of race, ethnicity, and gender in demystifying the belief of a monolithic Black identity in counselor education. And next, we have Fabiola jean Louise. Um, was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and moved to Brooklyn, New York at a young age. While attending the High School of Fashion Industries, her passion for the arts flourished. Fabiola discovered her talent for photography many years later in November 2013, while on a journey of artistic rediscovery. She began taking self-portraits as a matter of convenience, shyness, and because she knew how to convey the story she wanted to tell using her body, later her work grew to include other subjects in costumes as well as sculptures made entirely out of paper. Today, her practice is focused on experimentation through the use of different techniques and disciplines. While her images have been described as magical, moody, and mysterious, Fabiola's, Fabiola's body of work is also that of visual activism as she challenges the hegemony of society. Simultaneously, her goal is to always to capture something that is not necessarily tangible in our world, something that is beyond our humanity and perhaps even greater than us. Her love of Afrofuturism, science, science fiction, pre and post-industrial eras, elves, fairies, and histories and folklore are also central themes in her work. Her current and ongoing series, Rewriting History, a three-part series consisting of period paper grounds, uh, painterly photographs, and Polaroids opened as a solo exhibition at Smithsonian Affiliates, Disabled Museum of African American History, Alan Avery Art Con Company, and Andrew Friedman House to critical acclaim. It also earned her acceptance into the highly sought after residency at the Museum of Art and Design, New York City in September, 2019. Fabiola was invited to join and participate in a brick media group exhibition border, bordering the imaginary art from the Dominican Republic, Haiti and their diasporas. So give it for our panelists. <laughs> um, and so next up we're gonna start and getting the discussion going. Um, so we kind of wanted to keep this conversation very organic. So we have some questions here for everyone on this board, but we want to keep everything flowing and we're going to reserve 30 minutes at the end for any questions. So if you have any, please put them in the chat and we'll get to those um, in that section. Um, so kind of starting off, many look at these images and the word power is somewhere in their synthesizing of the experience. There is a power one observes in these women, not only with the women in the gowns and their gaze, but what it represents in context. At the same time, one can and has also asked, is there a reason or rather what happens when we come to understand the power of black women through white colonial contexts? What would you say to that? Hmm. Anyone on the panel? I'm still thinking, I'm still thinking about my, my full answer, um, but what I will say immediately to that is, I think contrast is very important. And I think for me with my work, using, using that lens, the European lens to show black power provides a wonderful contrast, right? Because I'm, I'm very, very oversensitive and aware of how society sees and misunderstands black power. Um, and that there's so many, there's so many um, problems with that, with how they relate to us and, and all of that thing. So when we're using that European lens to talk about our experiences, our pain, our traumas, our everything, um, we're really providing a sharp contrast which in turn, I, I feel, um, also puts a nice spotlight on black power. Um, there's also something to be said about the, for me, opposite of power, which is um, taking trauma and instead of, and I'm trying to find my proper words for this, but instead of putting the responsibility on the victim, removing that and saying that the oppressor gets all the credit for it 
And that's for me also the very important reason why it, I want to um, show the, the Black experience through that European lens is because first I want to remove responsibility from the victim and place it where it belongs. Um, so it's a multi-layered thing and I apologize for not necessarily having the perfect words for that, but I, I think I hope everybody understands where I'm leading with that. Yeah, I um, to add to to that, um, I started off the essay, um, my essay, uh, a little bit uh, with the under, with the understanding that um, or the expression that I was conflicted, right? Because here are these beautiful gowns, these beautiful period gowns, and yet, you know, from um, my perspective, I had to look at the gowns as a tool, right? but also question what does it mean that our visibility you know is only seen perhaps you know through western european fashion or these period gowns and so i really went through a journey uh, of you know working with that and and my understanding that i can enjoy and take pleasure right and the beauty of these gowns and understand that the power comes with the presence of the black body in them. And I think that's where I really ended uh, my essay in that, you know, these gowns, we know of these gowns, you know, prior to your work, but really it's the presence of blackness and such black power, right? That gives, that, that gives power to the overall, you know, um, visual that we see. So that whether the women are wearing the gowns or they're juxtaposed to, juxtaposed to them by the actual photos, that it is the completion, right, of the two that gives, that brings empowerment to the entire exhibition. And I think to add to that, um, I would also say, Fabiola, for what you said, kind of bringing in those new contexts and what it does then as a viewer um, when you're kind of going through the dynamic process of what Dr. Jackson is talking about, um, your kind of first impression of him being kind of guided through this thought process when you're now brought to this new image is also a process to be, you know, lauded as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of that is truth. All of that is truth. Um, and it's also reclaiming a lot. Uh, it's not. It's not obvious to many people, but. Um, there was a part of the video that I love very much, which is this exchange of culture. Um, and I think it's Dr. Tanisha that, that said that. Um, this exchange of culture is important. Now, the part that, the part that I'm, I'm also spotlighting is not necessarily the exchange of culture, but the theft of culture and the theft of even um, our body parts as Black women. You know, the small waist, the big hips, the big butt. Um, I went to, to a fashion industries high school and I studied fashion um, for four years. So it wasn't lost on me that these gowns were really, or this fashion was really inspired by the black female body, the black woman. Um, and that's really important because we're, we're it's not that we didn't wear those garments, we were totally unrepresented in that space, of course, um, but our bodies were used to inspire that fashion. So rewriting history also then becomes a place where I can, I can reclaim that, in and in, in a sense, reclaim how our bodies have been fetishized throughout history and continues to be today. Absolutely, awesome. So moving on to the next question, the question of background of the artist. Can I add something? Oh, sure, sure. Yes. Well, I, I just, I mean, I was, that's, I'm really excited to hear that part, Fabiola, about the, um, the black body being um, inspiring this fashion. I, I was also going to just talk about white space, what white space is and how when you bring, you know, it's sort of like white space is basically the default background. And so what I like about your work or what I really enjoy is how you're making us question, you know, um, 
its value and why these things are we're being see, are being shown and other things are being hidden. So, I thank really you. That. Thank you. Did any other panelists want to add into that question? Sure, I would like to add because I remember um, Fabiola talking a little bit about the reclaiming or the theft of these these dresses or the appearance of the designers of going on in the in the exhibition. But one thing I was thinking of as we were like I was watching the video again, it kind of seems like a revolution, like having all these women who are not supposed to be in these dresses or spaces, and there are multiple of them. So it kind of feel it could feel offensive to people who enjoy this white space, right? So I was kind of thinking of how that brings back or reclaiming or taking back of the theft of power that they always had despite the context um, that black women had as we look at the whole exhibition. So it's like this revolution happening as these women are in the space, even though they're in art form. Y'all are so brilliant. And that touches on the other questions that I'm gonna let uh, be answered later, but the, the, the revolution and being a Haitian artist, um, those are on purpose. And I love that you said that um, because yes, that is, part, that is part of the work and it's, it's done on purpose. I just um, also wanted to add that while you were um, speaking of reclamation, um, it takes me to um, the space of, or this notion of Sankofa, right? Mm -hmm. To go back and reclaim mm -hmm. and how it is important for us to do that in order for us to move, to move forward. And I know that there's a question about Afrofuturism, but that in and of itself um, is what reclamation allows or gives space to. Mm -hmm. So to go back and reclaim, to really um, examine, right? Uh, the past, um, where we can acknowledge the erasure, the absence, and then from there, have a pathway for, for the future. And so I just wanted to say that because I think it's important to, under, to recognize those very you know, Afrocentric concepts and how they play into our journey of, of developing you know, the present and the past, or in the future, excuse me, yes. And I think also the collective feeling that we all have as then Black viewers and viewers as a whole, when we have this new kind of recontextualized images, what does that do is even a larger question to someone like Fabiola's work. Um, how do we then reimagine ourselves and reconfigure ourselves in spaces and kind of go forward in that thought because images represent so much to us. Um, and so moving forward, if that's okay with everyone. Um, the question of background of the artist must come into question in this day and age, especially it often finds itself front and center, even if not preferred. Fabiola is a Haitian American artist. Haiti is interesting because too many it's uh, to many it's country it's a country that represents many things, but among these, a country that represents power and its rebellion against the French state. These images also represent a sort of rebellion, a rebellion against the canon that places Black women in the background or as victims. A lot of conversation evaluating this work and in this conversation today comes from a Black American context. Shana on this panel also comes from a Haitian background. What is the degree upon which our personal histories come to affect the worlds and dialogues we create in our art, academia, and discourse? Further, in discussing this work, how do U.S. creators relate to Black American experience and context? I'm sorry, all can you ask, there's a two part question. Can you ask the first yeah. part? Yeah, so the first part of the question is asking what is the degree upon which our personal histories come to affect the world and dialogues we create in our art discourse and academia? Do you want me to save the second half? Uh, no, go again. Go and again. then the second half is further in discussing this work, how do you as creators relate to the Black American experience in context? And not only just relate, but also how do you juxtapose it and kind of work against that and work with it? Um, well, first things first, um, I have to correct and say that I identify as a Haitian artist, not a Haitian American artist. Um, that's very important to me because at the very center of the work is my, my Haitian identity. Um, and even though I came here at a young age, I went back to Haiti every summer, spent the whole summer. Um, I was raised in a Haitian household and all these cultures. So, that is really what inspires the work. And I say that because 
I understand the history of Haiti. I understand its past. I understand its its future. And I'm I'm really trying to have a little bit of foresight in its in in its future right now, or its its past, its present, and its future. Um, all that to say that with what with what Chena said about the army, um, this answers part of this this part of the dialogue, which is they look like women that are part of a, an army because they are. Um, they are part of the resistance. They are, these dresses are almost, not even almost, they are their armor. Um, and they do represent women that I imagine um, existed during the Haitian Revolution. This is, the Haitian Revolution is something that um, keeps me up at night <laughs> in a beautiful way. Um, it guides the work every day and, it, and it, it helps me communicate with my ancestors um, because it is one of the most amazing uh, parts of history where we can find greatness in resistance. Um, and I try to figure out how we can do that again, recreate that. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm necessarily answering that question, um, but I am speaking to how my Haitian identity and culture um, and understanding of it definitely impacts the work of rewriting history um, and answering to the, the statement about the fact that in one room, all of these women look like um, warriors or warriorses. What's the proper word for that? <laughs> uh, because they are. And yeah, so, um, and so, I'd actually, I'm really happy to see how the conversation's then shifting from one question to another. And I think that's the beauty of organic dialogue. And Shana, did you have anything to add from that from your perspective? Well, yeah, I wanted to just add a little bit about like, I just remember like as a kid, like how my parents pushed me, um, how they pushed me, whether it was like I'm paying lacrosse on the field in middle school or whether it was um, education. Like my father always told me like, I never got a chance to do this. So you have to do all that you want to do. And I will sacrifice all that I have to make sure that you accomplish this. And I think that as Fabiola talks about uh, the collective resistance, I think that in that collective resistance that they had to go through and whatever history they had, I think it kind of travels in and how they raised me. Um, and I think I can never let go of that. And then when I'm thinking about my own personal narrative, like, and thinking about my own work, like I think my work I always say is me search and we search because it's about myself and my people and how I can make sure that I am giving back to all the people who have given to me, even if it's not in a linear perspective, even if it's something collective, like an article on Afro-Caribbean or doing a, a dissertation on Afro-Caribbean women's self-identity development. So I think in adding like to the personal histories, I think there's no way for me to even do my work without my history. Like there's no way for me to even be who I am without my culture, right? Because like without, if I suppress culture, you suppress your self identity. So you suppress yourself. So it's just like, I can't do that as a person. So therefore all my work has to do with where I came from and where my people have come from. So that's how I see it for myself. And I guess kind of a question to kind of contextualize maybe to Fabiola too and um, everyone on the panel. It's also a question that's formulating in my head and that was at the root of the question was, when we come to, under, you know, this panel is full right now, we are, you know, based in America. And when we're putting our art in these circumstances that are not of our personal histories, and you guys are just, you know, describing these, you know, graphic kind of visual archives from your history. Um, and so when we place them in new narratives, how does that affect, if it does, kind of just inviting the conversation, does that become a part of the thought process um, and what it represents to different groups of people? I come from a Guinean uh, family and these images represent something to me in the fabric because I think of kente cloth. Um, and so thinking of all those different things in those layers, when we create work from our personal histories, how is the way that we kind of look at the ways in which they start to kind of multiply outwards in these different contexts and kind of the thought of that as a creator and an academic um, when you put work out in general. 
Yeah, well, there's definitely an overlap for me with all of those things. Um, because with my work, I'm not just looking at Haitian history and the Black experience through just a Haitian lens. I'm looking at how Europe has impacted Haiti. I'm also looking at how Haiti has impacted the Underground Railroad in America. Those things all very much overlap. There's a lot of people who don't realize in America that um, the Underground Railroad was very much inspired by the Haitian Revolution. In fact, it took nearly 100 years for word um, to travel to America that there, there was a Black free nation, right? So it's very important to find those places where, you know, Black resistance and success and all of those things overlap because while we won't find this, you know, these experiences that are linear, we'll find that we've been all really fighting for very similar things. We've, we've all been resisting for the same things. We've all been trying to reclaim or claim space. Um, and so what you're doing at the end of that, I hope, or what I see, is a gathering of all these different Black experiences that will one day create the army, create another form of the resistance. Um, that's a long way away uh, because I because within that there's all these 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 holes that have been placed in there where we have colorism and we have you know different ways where Black people go against each other. Uh, but once we start to to fill those holes with something that means more we'll be able to really see how these experiences, as different as they are, um, are very, very, very similar. Um, and that's what I'm really trying to do with my work is to, 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 to bridge those gaps. Um, so African American history is vital, vital to the work that I'm doing um, today, is vital to it tomorrow, and is vital as it relates to Haitian history. And I know just to add something, because Fabiola, you pinned something that I always say all the time is that sometimes when I people see my work, they think it's a new body of work. It's just like Afro-Caribbean people, like it's not a new body of work, I think. And it also sometimes makes people pin against Afro-Caribbean people to African-American people when it doesn't need to be a battle against the two ethnicities. Um, I think sometimes I always like to say that it's a puzzle piece. So we need to bring back the pieces of the whole puzzle. And I think that's more of what I'm trying to do for my work. And I think sometimes people can conceptualize it as this new branch or this, um, this new part of understanding the black identity when we're like, we're all one part. <laughs> like, we all just have different pieces to play, but when we all play the, the piece that you have, then you see the beauty of the diversity within the black identity. And I think um, sometimes I push back when people say like the nuances or it's just like, we're all black people. And I think sometimes that gets to be completed. Yes, there's nuances with different ethnicities, but at the same, great we are all people who come from the same place and i think that also has um great value as well that sometimes gets mistaken or misunderstood oh i mean so one last thing is that that's very true you know even with rewriting history and that's not even my only body of work but even with that body of work people often ask me why are you trying, why are you using a, why are you looking through or showing this black experience through the European lens? Uh, as a Haitian artist, this does not look like Haitian art, right? So there's so many layers to that and so many different misunderstandings to first of all, the black experience and that it changes, right? And that um, Haitian art, black art, because it changes, it looks like many things. And the other thing is, it's, a, it's Haitian art because as a Haitian artist, I touched it, <laughs> right? It is what it is because I said it is because that's how I identify. So it's really trying to break down all of these different ways that people have these misconceptions about experiencing um, Black art, Black experiences, Black voices, claiming of space and all of that. Um, but, you know, 
that's another part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add to that because this conversation has been uh, con uh, continuous. Um, when we think about the trajectory of Black art, and particularly this notion of what Black art is supposed to look like, right? Should it be figurative? Should you actually have Black bodies in the art in order for it to actually be recognized as Black art? Or is it Black art because, to your point, Fabiola, you touched it, right? I'm a Black person who created this art. And so there have been movements where the, you know, the popular opinion has shifted and changed. I can think about uh, like the black arts movement where there were specific aesthetics that were you know, written out and this is to determine what black art is and how things have shifted and changed, particularly within postmodern, uh, a postmodern period, which is where we're really situated. And so, you know, I'm of the opinion uh, that if a person uh, from the African diaspora of African descent created the art that that in fact is black art. And I feel like just having this discussion shows just how multifaceted we are, how diverse and complex we are as a people. And to go back to the question, uh, Ohima, that you mentioned um, as a creative, as you know, in my own practice, um, I found joy in um, and how you really cross periods within your work. So I can, and how I had to actually hunt, right? The iconography of your work. There were symbols that, you know, connected to your Haitian culture, but there were symbols that connected to, um, I would say uh, antebellum period. If we think about whipping Pete, that, that famous image of the whip back, right? And how, you know, there's this mixing of culture, there's this mixing of period periods that draw many people together, right? Regardless if you have a Haitian background or, you know, like for example, my own personal background, I'm, you know, I identify as African American Liberian because my father is from Liberia. And so the, my own cross-cultural experience of, you know, growing up in an African American community and but also this Liberian community, it helped, it was something that I connected with to see how the merging of these images um, can really draw people in and, so, and someone can find their own, right, their own place or space, um, even if they don't have a Haitian background. And then anyone else wanted to add to that question? So moving forward, this is one of my favorite questions because it involves one of my favorite quotes. Um, and so the great thing about this work among many aspects is the disruptive nature of it. There's a great quote by Janet Mock, the executive producer of Pose, if you haven't watched these yet, uh, when she describes, my favorite images are the ones where someone who isn't supposed to be there, who's in a space, a space where we were never ever welcomed in, we're not invited, yet we walk in and we show all the way up. I, and I think many others could share that sentiment in some capacity at the joy as viewers we feel seeing ourselves in this space, specifically as black women. Tanisha Jackson talks about black women creating art as an act of care for themselves and their community. What role, if any, do you think this art plays in that conversation? the first one this time. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not sure if the question is specific to the artist first or. Sure, I kind of like to keep it open, but this one I think it's mentioning you and would love your insights first, but it can go to anyone. I could talk more. <laughs> okay, sure, I, can, I can definitely talk about um, self-care um, and how I definitely um, see elements of that or and, and really um, wellness uh, in this exhibition. So um, I love to think about like this um, model called the breathe model, where it talks about black women finding wellness through balance, reflection, uh, the energy that we share, uh, association as coming together. Like even in this moment, this is a form of wellness because we're black women on this panel is talking and engaging in about you know, uh, our own experiences, this art. Uh, transparency, healing, and empowerment. 
So in looking at this, uh, this exhibition, we've talked about power, right? How you can find empowerment uh, within the images. Um, I think a big uh, theme within this work is reflection and how we need to reflect on our experiences as a collective, as well as individually in order to find our own health and wellness, especially when we think about how we may harness, you know, um, there, are, there are, um, experiences that may be uh, connected historically from the past that impact us, right? So, um, and so really reflecting on those things help us to have wellness. And I feel like that this particular exhibition or your uh, rewriting history brings in elements of that model. Um, the, you know, the transparency that's there. And then also, and I, I conclude um, my essay with this being a pathway to, for healing. Because through, right, the exhibition, we're able to have dialogue that we don't necessarily, or that we don't often have, um, except for when it, it, there, we're in formal spaces, someone's asking a specific question like today, um, but this creates an opportunity, or your work, I should say, creates an opportunity for Black women to heal and, and, and also others as well. I, I don't think it's exclusive to Black women, but and true to, and maybe this is an essentialist point of view, to who we are, I feel like we facilitate healness for many people. Yeah, yeah. So that's, where I, that's where I'm at within the space of wellness and healing. Yeah, um, I love that. And, and wellness, wellness and healing is also central. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm also often asked, what is the cent central message of the work that I do? And it's not one thing. Um, identity is important, but wellness is equally as important to the identity aspect of things. Because for me, I often say that we, I really believe that we can't have an idea of where we're going unless we know where we've come from. So identity and having an understanding of our history, our past is so important to help inform our current and our future. Um, I see myself as a time traveling artist, which means that in my work there, you're going to see elements of, of historic uh, fashion and, and identities and all of those things, aesthetics, but you're also going to get a sense of futurism um, and how do those two things, the past and the future relate to the present. Mm -hmm. At the center of all of that is, is black wellness, but that's connected to identity. And that's also connected to justice. And for me, what is justice? Justice is holding people accountable. Um, and, and it's, not, it's more than just saying, oh, you know, we're gonna, you know, justice is not winning a case in court. We know this is not true for, for communities of color. Justice is, I don't own that, you own that. Mm -hmm. You have to acknowledge that. And I'm gonna keep telling the truth until you do because until everybody realizes that this is the truth, right? It's taking the thing that's true that was made out to be a lie to make it true again and make sure that everybody sees it and believes it to be. That is part of my wellness journey. Um, and it's very nuanced. It's very nuanced in the work, um, but it is there. It is very there. And it's wrapped in that space of, of identity and claiming space. Um, how do we allow black women, men, children, whomever, to see us as um, being, being in a space that we have always influenced, also vandalizing, I like vandalizing certain things, right? Vandalizing an old narrative that no longer works, um, that is not true, um, and shifting all of those things. Um, so that's for me, if I can do that in my work, I feel that I'm adding to um, the medicine that we can pull from when it comes to healing and wellness. 
So if I could, if I can ask a question real quick, because you were talking and I was curious. I always, when I'm talking to artists, ask them, who are they creating for? Because I think that's important to understand, you know, and so is it for you, you know, like, or, and if it's more than just yourself or multiple people, which comes first? Mm, that's a, you know, that's a great and layered question. I would say when I enter my, and I, this is just me diving right into my, my everyday um, way of life. When I enter my space to create, when I'm thinking about the work, I'm thinking about others first. Mm, okay. Always others first. Um, in, in that space, I'm there. This is the way that I connect with my people. And my people is not just my black viewers. It is, you know, the alliances that we have. It is the people that are working with us. It's all of that. So when I say my people, it's not, it's not to exclude anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but it is to say that I am thinking about history. I'm thinking about my people. And I'm thinking about my message. What do I want to say to these people that are going to receive it as a gift? I'm also, but it's not just one thing. I'm also in heavy conversation with my ancestors when I create. And so I got to satisfy the Haitian ancestors. <laughs> you know, I got to set all, all of the ancestors, not, the, not just the Haitian ones, but I, I, I really go into a trance. Oftentimes I'll create a whole dress in whatever amount of time it takes. I present that and someone says, well, how long did that take? What, how did you do that? And I don't know. I, I have absolutely no idea because I don't sketch anything. It's just now that I've started sketching my work so I can have some sort of documentation of what I'm doing. But all of rewriting history was never sketched. Um, it was all just conversations and communication that I was having with my ancestors and the messages that I was trying to convey to my people. Um, somewhere I'm in, I'm in that space. And so it's all good, you know, <laughs> it's just, um, I'm not here. The sim the most simple answer is that I'm not actually really here on this planet when I'm making the work. Yeah, I think that that's, um, and not to take up space, but just, uh, I think that's important because what that um, expresses to me is that we can command space, right? Mm. Multiple spaces and sometimes need to, going back to this notion of healing, right? And of wellness, um, sometimes this temporal space is not enough, right? And so going into a creative space, what that means, um, I hear you saying that um, just like you time travel within your art, you actually are going perhaps in, you know, some other traveling spaces as well, yes. whether it's ancestral or, you know, uh, on another plane, so. Very true. Very like, true. as we talk a little bit about like space and healing, like as a counselor and therapist, like that is my field of work. And I think one of the biggest reasons why therapy is so helpful, especially for people of color and specifically black women, I think it's it's because they are see, being seen. Like I see you and you see me. And I think there there's power in that. And I think there even when looking at the the exhibition specifically, um, there's always a look. I, and I, not being a, a a visual artist, but just being more of a feeler as a counselor. So I go with what I feel when I see art, when I see art, and what. I always felt is that they see me and we see each other. And that is like an empowering feeling for me. And I think that empowerment also brings healing. When you feel empowered, you do more. When you do more, you feel well. <laughs> I think it's, it's the cycle of that. And I think just being seen and noticed allows in a society where you're usually not seen and noticed, especially as black people or black women, um, I think that is powerful in art um, and then specifically in this exhibition. Yeah, well, what, I, what I'll say to top that it, or to add the cherry to what you said, because I think it's perfect and beautiful also is we cannot become what we don't see. Mm. 
Mm. I'm not the first person to say that. This is a you know a great saying that I go by. You know, we have to we have to show examples of how we see ourselves and how we truly are in order to inspire and to create a space where others can, you know, fill in that that area and and become that magic, right? If we never see black women being celebrated and claiming space and being honored and having that black gaze and and just and just living life and inspiring society and culture in all the ways that we do, our black children are they don't have a very beautiful future. Um, and that's the other part to the uh, the answer that I was asked before, who am I communicating with? Um, my children. I have, I'm a mother, I'm a mother to five children now. And um, I, I often think about my legacy, which, which is very egotistical in some way. I, I understand that, yeah, the idea of legacy, but still. When I think about what I leave behind for my kids and how I've influenced their black lives or their biracial black identifying lives, um, it needs to have black mama bear all over that. <laughs> um, and I really am also using my work to do that. I'm leaving. I'm using my work to leave these little trinkets of messages for my children, um, so that it can help further interrupt anything else that might come up in their black lives moving forward. Um, so it's really also about, and which is why I said I'm a, a futuristic artist. It's, it's not just thinking about Afrofuturistic art. It's thinking about Afrofuturism as a whole. And that encompasses parenthood. That encompasses our everyday actual lives. How can we impact the future? For me, that's through my children. And I think we're starting to naturally get into this question here. So I'll ask it and we can continue. I apologize, my camera's having troubles back and forth. Um, but I believe that we are in an age of renaissance, a renaissance of black imagination with contemporaries like Kahinda Wiley and exhibits like the Black Models exhibit, putting black models from European paintings at the forefront. There's a larger conversation to be had about the power of this imagination and the futures it begins to unlock. A lot of this new movement in Black imagination can thank the Afrofuturist movement from the late 1960s that started in literature. We find ourselves now in an age where science isn't the only frontier that, um, that is the future and ask ourselves more questions about all the places Blackness was occluded or diminished, but simultaneously was so critical. They say as an artist, your importance doesn't peak until after your lifetime. With this larger conversation, what role does your work um, like this play in the conversation of the future? What will these images mean? Well, I'm going to actually quote or try to quote my one of my favorite artists, which is Nina Simone, in saying that it is our absolute responsibility to respond to our environment, right? Basically, it was what she was saying. We, it's really vital that we tell the stories and we respond to what's going on in our time. Um, and I think that that's what I hope that's what my work is doing right now. It's somehow speaking to not just all the other things that I spoke to, but you know, it gives a little solace even in the times of, of stress and trauma that we're going through now currently. I don't know that that's a full answer to the question um, because it's like many things very, very layered. Um, but I do believe that Staying silent as a as a black woman for me is just not an option, um, and I was never I was I I very early on understood something about my personality that I was not um, very comfortable being on the front lines of a protest. Uh, it's not because I think it's wrong. It's not at all. It's I, I'm like cheering on, you know, in the back. It's just a personality thing for me. I'm so shy. And I'm, I'm so like in the shadows of things that even taking credit for something that I've done often has been difficult for me. Um, so it was imperative for me to understand in my, in, my, in my artistic career, how could I translate that shyness into um, a way 
that I, or a personality that could really speak to the time and be an activist because active, you know, being an activist is extremely important for me. For me, that's my work. So I call myself also a visual activist because um, I do see it as my responsibility to, to add something to, to our experiences. Did anyone want to add anything to that? So moving forward. Oh, I, I, want to, I just want to say. Um, We're cutting you a little in and out, Yvonne. I don't know if you would you may not appreciate it. I often in the chat. I like them in the chat. Yeah. It's kind of hard with these things on Zoom, but we're making the best of it. <laughs> okay, let me put up my chat so I can see the question. And as we approach 7.30, we're also going to be opening up for discussion. So if anyone had any questions they wanted to prepare, um, you could do so now. Okay, so Yvonne, I see you said, I think of the matrix you are creating with blue pills. I freaking love that. I love that. <laughs> so yes, um, that is my goal. And to be honest with you, I have never had somebody really pinpoint something that I thought in my head, in my studio, in my private time, which was, blue pill or red pill, <laughs> you know? I did that. I actually did that when I was creating the work, which was um, thinking about the matrix, thinking about unplugging. I, I have that in my mind every day. Yeah, like you hit it on the nail with that because I really have that in my mind every day. How do I use my work to help people unplug and interrupt, you know, narratives and all of those things and, and to have, ha have them see things that they didn't necessarily see or, or realize before. My first experience of really penetrating that, honestly, was in Encinitas, California. Um, that is a predominantly, or I will say almost entirely white <laughs> area of California, which is, it straddles um, San Diego. And I was there for a three month uh, residency and so you can imagine that the, the, the patrons that came to see the exhibition were really white. They were white. And I really had to think about this, this idea of matrix. Will I be able to penetrate their white bubbles? Will I be able to you know, show them these different narratives and truths that really do exist? And, and thank goodness I was able to do that. But, Yes, the matrix is always in my mind about how do I burst these bubbles of, of, act, of, of falsity, right? Um, of false narratives. Exactly, and I think to that I would even add, like I think something I always remember is growing up and didn't have a lot of images like the ones that we're so populated with today. And so I guess when I ask kind of what will these images mean is almost kind of placing, you mentioned that you're a mother and placing yourself in the eyes of a child and, when this image is referred to, let's say, in a history of like, you know, years and hundreds of years from now, what kind of, what will that represent and what does that do? And to me, at least what I predict is it's just an unlocking of an entire category of thought um, that doesn't at times exist um, for us because it's not shown. Um, there are not many images that will take and do what you're doing um, and what that means and does to and, you know, like to contemporaries as well. Um, you mentioned the times of now and we're in coronavirus and actually we know it's 730. So I would like to actually stop that question and invite everyone else. <laughs> um, so if you guys have any questions, you could put them in the chat. I don't know if there's a raising hand thing and what can I see? Are there any questions out there? You can also turn your mic on. Microphones are welcome. Conversation. It's not a question. I'm that white person who's talking first, so I apologize. I just wanted to say I feel quite literally blinded by what I'm witnessing from what you have to say tonight. I do not have a question that could be substantive enough because 
what you're doing is already that. And I just wanted to say thank you for this experience and thank you for everything you've had to say. Truly, thank you. Oh, thank you, Neil. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think though, I, I thank the whole panel and everyone who is who has um, joined this conversation and, and values it. Um, I think that anyone who is open-minded enough to centralize these types of conversations is really helping to do the work. Um, we need people like all of you here to continue to do that work and, and, and hear black voices and, and see black art and experiences as, as real, true, valid, um, and beautiful. And, and just by the very fact that you're, you're all here, it says a whole lot. So I really appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a question here in the chat from Sajala Surratt. Um, people often use reductive hashtag labels on artists, whether it's talking about female artists or black artists. How do you feel about this labeling of minority artists and through which lens do you hope that the public views your work? Mm. You know, I've gone, over the years I've gone through, I've, I've flip-flopped with that. I don't, I don't think one answer is true. I, I used to believe like Basquiat that um, I don't wanna be known as a black artist. I just wanna be called an artist because white artists are not, that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, come before their titles, right? They're not called white artists, they're just artists. And I agree with that. I still agree with that. But I think two things can be true. It's, it's just like two fl the flip sides of each of one coin or two sides of one coin. While I agree with that, I also feel that my identity is very, very, very important in telling people what perspective is being used to tell a story, right? I really want my viewers and my audience to understand that this is very much coming from the perspective of a Black Haitian woman. I celebrate that. I love that. Um, and, and I take pride in that, to be honest with you. And it's something for me, kind of frustrating when I'm looking at art and I'm like, I love this art. The next question that comes into my mind, maybe it's just me, is where does this artist come from? You know, what do they, like, what lens are they, what lens are they using? What's their, well, how do they identify? Like what, how was this created? And so I, for me in my work, I'm just kind of knocking all of that out. You don't need to ask those questions because you automatically know this is coming from a Haitian black artist that identifies as female, as woman. Um, so the labels don't necessarily bother me, but again, I'll say that I don't think either one is wrong. I don't think it's wrong for an artist to say that they don't want to be labeled any of those things. I think it's fine to be totally, you know, ambiguous in that space, um, as well as claiming that and, and making that very obvious to, to your viewers when it comes to representing your work. So we have another question here. Hello, Fabiola. Thank you for sharing your art and your process with us. It's been so exciting to see it and to be able to have a little window into the work. Oh wait, not a question, just a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and that was from Beth A. Ferry. Another question here, you mentioned that while you are creating, you have conversations with your ancestors and also much of your art is created for your children. Do you think you may one day integrate the past, present, and future in your art by collaborating with your children on work in the future to tell you, your and their story together? Uh, that's, that's really great. Yes, um, I will. My daughter, one of my daughters is in rewriting history, actually. Um, it's the piece with the violin and the cotton at her feet. That's my eldest, who's now 22. Um, but and then my my second daughter is going to be in the news the new body of work that I've created now as a whole as a collective yes I, I would love to make a piece that incorporates all of us um, it's been very tricky for me as a black artist and I, and I think this is kind of an unfortunate where I do have to think strategically about um, how skin color 
is 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 uh, experienced through my work. Meaning to say, when I was doing writing history, I had to be very strategic about when I placed my very light skinned daughter in that work. Um, and this is a responsibility that I, I really dislike having as a black artist. I wish that I did not have to think or deal with colorism within my culture, my, 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 my you know, black communities and all of those things. It's, it's something that really bothers me that we still have to deal with this. Just the same, it's reality and I understand why we do deal with it. And so I couldn't just introduce a very white looking model into that space. I had to be very strategic about when and where and what story I was going to tell. Um, the reason is I have to approach our experiences, our nonlinear experiences as Black people in that way, right? And sometimes it takes time to say, this is also a Black person <laughs> and have that be received and accepted without question, right? Um, a lot of times with my work, I found that the most people that question that piece with my daughter are Black people. It's not a white person that's saying, that's not a Black girl. It's Black people saying, that's not a Black girl. <laughs> you know, and so that I, I find that even within my work, I'm dealing with our misconceptions of what Blackness is. And I'm really peeling, trying to peel away these many different layers and definitions that we have of what Blackness is. So all that to say that when I feel that I'm in a very, very comfortable place um, with being able to respond to that with my work, um, which is very soon, I would love to have my family and my, my children in that because we're all different shades. And I think that really will represent how I see us as Black people. All And so we have, you know, there's a lot of questions here, hold on. So there's actually a follow-up question from before from Yvonne, it says to follow up about labels. What about being labeled as opposed to self-labeling? That's another good question. Um, I prefer self-labeling. I don't like to be placed in a box at all. Um, that's true for even my, my, my gallery that I'm signed with. Do not label me, do not place me in the box. I'll tell you how I identify. I believe that I have autonomy and I get to say how and who I am um, and how I see myself. And so I think that's a really good question though because a lot of people don't really see those two sides, labeling versus self-labeling. Self-labeling is perfectly fine for me. Um, okay. and another comment, we have your identity does come across strongly and that's what makes your work so strong. Um, another comment before a question um, from Kishi and Amashan. Um, just a comment, I love this panel and I love diversity among Black African diaspora, Haitian, Liberian, African American, Ghanaian, and from a Nigerian American in the audience. Um, from Paul Humphrey, we have a question. Hi, Fabiola, and thanks so much for this discussion. I have a question on behalf of my students at Colgate University. We had a virtual tour of the exhibition, thanks to Sarah Felice. Thanks, Sarah. During the tour, a student asked about <laughs> the printed text on the paper used for the corset on the dress in Rest in Peace and Madame Leroy. If the printed text on the paper was chosen on purpose, what was it and why did you choose it? See, I love people pick on those little details because it's very, it's, um, it's important. So I, I actually, the text is on, European and American capitalism. Um, there's some books from philosophy, um, history. There's even little parts of the constitution in there. So a big part of it was on purpose, um, but there's other parts where I just, it was really a reflection of me trying to decide where rewriting history was gonna go. That was the very first dress that I ever created from rewriting history. And at first I thought the dresses were all going to have some type of text um, leading to the discussion on the constitution, fragility of power and all of those things. Um, and after that dress, I, I decided that I, I actually didn't want text to be so obvious in the work. And so I changed it, which is why you, you don't see that again 
or the text feature again until the violin. Um, and so it's two parts. What, it's purposeful, uh, but it also shows um, the very beginning parts of this body of work where I'm, I'm trying to figure out the direction of where I want to go with it. And then we have a raised hand from Benny Guzman. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you uh, to all the panelists. Um, this has been an amazing talk. I've needed this talk for a while. Um, so one thing too, Tanisha, don't be afraid to take up space. Like I love, like women of color have been told to not take up space. So keep taking up space, Tanisha. <laughs> but, um, but so this is kind of a complicated question and it kind of is based on something you said, Fabiola. Um, so, and this kind of is for all the panelists, but I'm wondering what, how you see the role of artists of color in their own artwork. And let me, I, or let me give context first. So I'm a visual artist as well. And um, actually Kehende Wiley was one of my main inspirations. Um, ironically though, um, I love Kehende first of all, but my work is kind of a, um, a push against Kehende because what I saw was um, urban people of color, people that look like me who would never be put in a museum were now being put in a museum but only because they were being presented in a very Eurocentric way. And, you know, you can argue that about a lot of different artists. You can argue that, um, you know, about a lot of art in general. And I'm wondering, is there a responsibility for artists of color to have these conversations? Is there a way in which we should be easier on ourselves about these conversations? Because I think you're, um, we're talking about wellness and representation, especially for communities of color. Um, who, for the most part, don't get to see themselves in art. So I'm wondering if y'all could speak to how you see that, um, you know, how, how you see that playing out. Um, and especially to thinking about wellness and representation um, for communities of color. Um, this is an awesome show. So thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let somebody else speak. I do have a response to that, but I don't, I also don't want to take up the airways. So I'll wait to see if anyone else has something to say to that question. I do, so I'll, I'll go. Um, so um, I do think that artists, um, well, one, I think that artists really run the world. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that so much of you know, what we have was um, created by somebody's imagination. The very chair that you're sitting in is a design, right? And so, um, but with that comes responsibility. And so, although um, I believe that artists should have autonomy in what they create, that there should be a space for them to, in their making process, to be able to express themselves, I think um, that there should be a level of responsibility in the images that, uh, that an artist or a creative uh, makes. And, um, and sometimes that comes with, you know, um, like the dialogue that we have, like the, the writing that takes place. And so I encourage artists to, to speak about their art, but also to actually write as well, to give voice. Because what I, what I believe is that whatever you're thinking about as a, as a creative and as an artist, and, and I'll speak for myself as well, in that moment, it is what you want it to be, your art. But once you release it out into the world, you have no control over how it's received, right? And what narratives that um, you know, people uh, ascribe to, to your artwork. And so I think that... Um, what I love about you know this body of work about what uh, Kahindi has and others is that there are it's not just that the work exists but that there is this multimediated experience where artists now can record like are being recorded and and are actually speaking to their work or they're curating in spaces like social media um, and I feel like um, controlling the narrative in ways that um, adds to that to their responsibility of images. And you know, there's a lot of art that can that can be politically charged and people may think it's offensive. 
and they have protested and said, you know, this shouldn't be in a museum or this shouldn't be public arts. I'm not, and I don't agree with that. But I think that artists should definitely and are actually taking control of the narrative of their work and are more empowered in, in ways that they weren't before, particularly because of technology and social media. And I think creatives should run with that. Yeah, and, and really quick, Benny, I wanna add that um, I really love the fact that you took it upon yourself to push back on Kahende Wiley's work, um, which is what I think I heard you say, um, considering that he was also an artist that heavily inspired you. It's very important for us as artists to, to piggyback or push back on or be inspired by or whatever you want to call it, another artist. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan in, of looking at what other artists are doing and saying, how can I add to this conversation? Can I? And what does that look like if I do? Because it's not, it's, it's really, it shouldn't be about Kehendi Wiley does what he does because he's this, you know, he's this isolated artist that just does this. He's in conversation with his, himself. He's not. Um, I hope that we're in conversation with each other and we can really, for me, that's the point of my work is to start a broader dialogue about the messages that I have. So how can one push back on that or add to that? So I love that you said that. Um, also, I think I heard you say uh, something about being too hard on ourselves as artists. Um, yes, artists can take themselves a little too seriously, um, but I've seen what it looks like when an artist doesn't take themselves seriously enough or serious enough. And I feel whenever I see that, that it's a total wasted platform that, you know, they're just waste, it's just wasted space, wasted airspace that they're taking because that's our bully pulpit, really. That's our way of responding to society, responding to what's going on. And let's be real, artists do help shape, shape society in some way. Um, so there has to be some level of seriousness in that. Can we be, be playful in that? Absolutely. Um, but I think it's really important for us to understand the responsibility that we have as artists when we're, when we're starting conversations and not less, let, let's not exist on a very superficial level with our messages. So next up, we have a question from Tajala, um, which says, what self-care ritual or practice do you employ in the course of realizing your photographic or multimedia pieces, particularly when so much of your work engages trauma or systemic violence? Hmm, that's a beautiful question. What self-care ritual or practice do you employ? One is I have I have an indoor garden. So nature is very important to my, my wellness, um, especially since I live in a city like New York. Um, I really try to incorporate that. Um, wine is another. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, there are times where I'll have a little glass of wine, a little plant to look at, a little book to read, and, you know, some news or a documentary playing in the background, and I'm getting a little bit of all the things that I love at once. Um, and there's so much more. There's so, so my wellness, my wellness is a lot because like I said, I'm a mother of five children. And so it, it, it really starts from that space when I'm thinking about my wellness. It doesn't start from a space of an artist. <laughs> you know, there's some single artists that don't have children and don't have their own families and they can just really look at that from a, through a lens of, of that alone. Um, but for me, I have to think about how can I navigate through all the noise and all of this and all of that to, to be able to tap into all the, um, the messages that I'm getting. So I do, I do tarot, I, I'm starting to read more. I, I have a door, a door is very important in my wellness because I can shut it. Um, so, you know, 
it's layered it's layered <laughs> and adding to that Ashanti wanted to add a comment here, so I'm reading these as I go. Um, your piece titled Passing really hit hard for me and created an emotional response in me. Just like your daughter, I've experienced situations where I was not considered to be Black by other Black people. There were times where I questioned my identity and felt like I didn't belong anywhere. However, no one knows me better than myself, despite what other people th might think of me or see me as. I really enjoyed your work and I hope to see more from you. Oh, you, thank you for sharing that, Ashanti. That's, um, I know how that feels. And I, I think I obviously look like a black woman, but I know how that feels. And, and it's difficult. And that's partly why I did this work. And I appreciate you for sharing that because, you know, black people have a lot to deal with. We're not just dealing with non-blacks. We're dealing with black people within our communities and we somehow have to try and validate our own identities to our own people. Um, that is exhausting and, to say the least and um, very painful and hurtful. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that we have to do. When we're talking about this work, it's important to see when we're saying that it's, it's nonlinear, right? The experiences, we also have to see that the response should also be nonlinear. And uh, we're not talking about changing the perspective of just white folks. We also have to do that within our own communities as well. Amazing. And with that, I think we're gonna, unless anything wants to add there. Um, I, I thought I saw a finger there, Dr. Jackson. I, I, <laughs> I did have a question, but I, I wanna be cognizant of time. You know, I'm really interested in process, your process. And also your, your uh, the choice of material, particularly paper. Paper is fragile, right? Paper doesn't last very long, the, the preservation of it. And so it's your work. And I'm, so I'm curious to know, one, have you figured out a way to preserve these paper dresses outside of photography, right? Because they're captured, right, through the, through the photographic lens. But how do you, you know, how are you preparing for, and I don't know how long it, it would take, right, for uh, its degradation, uh, for it to, you know, to crumble or whatever, but this is something that I'm, I'm sure you're thinking of, right? Yes. The fragility of your work. Yes. So I am a practicing Buddhist, and so fragility and the ability to let go is very important as part of my my Black identity. I'm also doing meditation in that, in that space to learn how to let go of my traumas, my pains, and all of that. So that means that it's especially important for me to work with a paper, uh, a material like paper that, is, that will not last long. Um, it's my way of releasing all of those things. At the same time, I am an artist and I am making a living off of this and there are people collecting my work. So I can't be like, here's my Buddhist artwork that's going to disappear <laughs> once you buy it, right? right. So yes, um, for instance, you know, there's this gold, this gold crown or headpiece that is all made out of paper, but it's also 24 karat gold. Um, so, and, and I used it, I used it in the piece that's right here, actually on the wall. Um, so those are examples of the ways that I am working towards making the paper last longer and longer and longer. So for instance, I use um, wood glue in my work. I use archival paper in my work. I use anything that's gonna help the, the work last longer. A lot of times, instead of using acrylic paints, I'm using natural pigments, which will also help preserve the work. So, you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting balance that I have to maintain because it's important for me to hold on to the idea of something that's going to fall apart and degrade at some point um, next to something that is going to live long enough to maybe be a relic. Um, I would love my work to be a relic for future studies while 
I want it to, to degrade in some way. So, you know, it's, I think both those things can be true in, in that space. And, and it definitely is for, for me and my, pro my process. Beautiful. So we just want to send a couple of thank yous here. First of all, thank you so much to everyone on this panel. Thank you for your time, your insights, your beautiful work as artists, academics, writers, and so much. Um, I also wanted to send a special thank you to Dr. Kishi for helping organize this and also my place here. And she was such an important part of my time at SU and I really appreciate her. And thank you to Sarah and all of Point of Contact for all this discussion and so much more. And it's always important to continue these dialogues past this time. So can you continue to reflect and you know, keep having these conversations? And I hope everyone here got a little something that they can continue to think about and work um, on and with themselves with. And so again, just thank you so much to everyone. And I think Sarah, take it away from yeah, I just, Ohima, you were amazing. Thank you. Um, I cannot say that enough. And thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure. Fabiola, this has been a long time coming for yes. us. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, on the note, when you were talking about the work, right, getting to work, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I hope there are brighter days ahead and you're very much part of that discussion. So thank you. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you. This was awesome. I have medicine for tomorrow. <laughs> I have work that I am creating and y'all have totally infused me with a lot of energy that I needed. So I really appreciate you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank have a good night so everyone. Much been a pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you.